May 3, 1999. In the heart of Oklahoma, the strongest wind ever recorded on Earth ripped through homes and highways at over 300 miles per hour. The Bridge Creek F5 tornado didn't just flatten empty land, it exploded straight into neighborhoods while families ate dinner and children played indoors. Science called it history's most extreme tornado, but for thousands, it was a catastrophe unfolding in real time. What chain of events unleashed such a force? And how did ordinary life vanish in seconds? Oklahoma's skies on May 3, 1999, were loaded with more than just springtime humidity. The atmosphere was primed for disaster, with ingredients coming together in a way that meteorologists rarely witness. By late afternoon, a deep surface low pressed down over southwest Kansas, tightening pressure gradients across central Oklahoma. Surface temperatures soared into the upper 80s and low 90s, while dew points hovered in the upper 60s and low 70s. That combination meant air was both hot and saturated, fuel for explosive thunderstorm growth. Above the ground, the wind profile was just as ominous. At about 1.5 kilometers up, the low-level jet screamed northward at over 40 knots. Higher still, the 500 millibar level saw winds racing past 70 knots out of the southwest. This created a shearing effect, with winds shifting direction and speed dramatically from the surface to the upper atmosphere. It's the classic setup for rotating supercells, the type of storm most likely to spawn tornadoes. The dry line, a sharp boundary separating moist gulf air from drier air to the west, cut through the region from southwest Oklahoma into central Kansas. By late afternoon, it surged eastward, focusing all that instability and wind energy into a narrow corridor right over the Oklahoma City metro. Meteorologists measured convective available potential energy, or CAPE, at astonishing levels, between 5,000 and 6,000 joules per kilogram. That's more than double what's considered highly favorable for tornadoes. At the same time, storm relative helicity, a measure of how much the wind spins with height, soared past 600 square meters per second squared. For perspective, values above 300 are already considered dangerous. As the sun dipped lower, supercell thunderstorms erupted west of Oklahoma City. These storms didn't just form, they sustained violent rotation for hours, feeding off the record instability and brutal wind shear. The dry line acted like a fuse, and the entire region became a powder keg. Over the next several hours, more than 70 tornadoes would touch down across Oklahoma and Kansas, some on the ground simultaneously. The intensity and density of storms overwhelmed even seasoned storm chasers and forecasters. This wasn't a routine severe weather day, it was one of the most volatile environments ever measured in the plains, and everyone in its path was at risk. By nightfall, the stage was set for something beyond the ordinary. The atmosphere's raw power was about to focus on a single, monstrous tornado, one that would leave a scar on Oklahoma's landscape and memory. 6. 23 p.m. Central Daylight Time In a field just west of Amber, Oklahoma, the first rotation touched down. The tornado began as a narrow funnel, almost unremarkable compared to what would follow. Within minutes, it grew, widening, darkening, pulling in debris and dust until the entire base of the storm pressed to the ground in a solid, roiling wall. Meteorologists call this a wedge tornado. To anyone on the ground, it looked like the horizon itself had come alive. The tornado wasted no time. It expanded rapidly, swelling to nearly a mile wide as it moved northeast through Grady County. The roar could be heard for miles, a sound survivors would later compare to a thousand freight trains. The storm's forward speed hovered around 30 miles per hour, but inside the core, winds were already tearing at everything in their path. Farmhouses, barns, and outbuildings on the outskirts of Bridge Creek began to vanish, swept from their foundations and scattered as splinters across open fields. For residents in Bridge Creek, the warning was the storm itself. The sky turned a sickly green and the air grew heavy. Power lines snapped, plunging neighborhoods into darkness before the tornado even arrived. In a matter of minutes, the wedge bore down on the heart of the community. The width of the vortex meant that destruction was not confined to a single street or block. 
entire subdivisions fell inside its path. As the tornado crossed Highway 92, it intensified further. Meteorologists tracking the storm noted the speed with which it grew, both in size and violence. By the time it reached the southern edge of Bridge Creek, the tornado was already at F4 strength. Roofs, walls, and vehicles were no match for the winds. Trailers and cars were thrown hundreds of yards, some wrapped around trees, others reduced to twisted metal and scattered far from where they started. The tornado's path was relentless. Over the next 85 minutes, it would carve a 38-mile scar through central Oklahoma, growing and shrinking in width but never losing its grip on the ground. At its peak, the wedge stretched nearly a mile across, wide enough to swallow entire neighborhoods in one sweep. The storm's trajectory pointed directly toward more densely populated suburbs, Moore, Newcastle, and the southern edge of Oklahoma City. For those communities, minutes were all that separated normal life from catastrophe. By the time the tornado left Bridge Creek behind, it had already established itself as a force beyond anything most meteorologists or residents had ever witnessed. The next towns in its path had little time to act, as the storm pressed forward, gaining strength and momentum with every mile. At 6.57 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the National Weather Service office in Norman faced a decision with no precedent. The tornado, now a mile wide and confirmed by radar and ground reports, was bearing down on the southern suburbs of Oklahoma City. Standard warnings, urgent as they were, suddenly felt inadequate. Lead forecaster David Andra scanned the incoming data. Damage reports from Bridge Creek, Doppler signatures showing a vortex of historic size, and spotter calls describing total destruction. He knew the usual language, tornado warning, take shelter now, did not capture the scale of what was coming. Andra made a call that would change severe weather communication forever. He drafted a new message, one that cut through routine phrasing and spoke directly to the gravity of the moment. The bulletin read, Tornado emergency in South Oklahoma City metro area. At 6.57 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a large tornado was moving into highly populated areas. For the first time, the phrase tornado emergency was used in a public warning, words chosen to convey that this was not just another tornado, but an imminent catastrophe for neighborhoods, schools, and businesses in the path. The message was relayed instantly. Local TV stations, KWTV, KOCO, KFOR, switched to continuous coverage. Meteorologists like Gary England broke into programming, their voices urgent, sometimes trembling. They showed live radar, chopper feeds, and maps with street-level detail. The warnings left no room for doubt. If you are in Moore or Southern Oklahoma City, you must take cover immediately. NOAA Weather radio echoed the same tone. Dispatches in emergency management relayed the message to police, fire, and ambulance crews. Sirens wailed across the metro, and public address systems blared in parks and shopping centers. The warning spread in minutes, giving people what little time they had to move to interior rooms, storm shelters, or wherever safety could be found. The decision to use tornado emergency was not made lightly. Andra later said, I wanted to paint the picture to residents that a rare and deadly tornado was imminent in the metro area. That night, the new language made its way into homes, cars, and workplaces, prompting action that would save hundreds of lives. The phrase has since become a national standard for the most extreme tornado threats. But on May 3, 1999, it was born out of necessity, in the heat of the moment, as a monster bore down on a city. Joshua Werman and his Doppler on Wheels team positioned their mobile radar just outside Bridge Creek, tracking the tornado as it reached its most violent stage. Their goal was simple. Capture, in real time, the true speed of the winds inside the vortex. On May 3, 1999, as the tornado swept through Bridge Creek, the DOW radar locked onto the inner core. The data it recorded would change the scientific understanding of what a tornado could do. The radar sampled winds at about 32 meters, roughly 105 feet, above the ground. Within that narrow slice, 
the DOW registered velocities peaking at approximately 301 miles per hour. Years later, a reanalysis of the raw data using improved processing and new techniques to correct for signal noise and debris pushed the number even higher, 321 miles per hour. No instrument, before or since, has measured a faster wind at ground level on Earth. These numbers came with caveats. The DOW measures the motion of debris, not air molecules themselves, and always at a certain height above the ground. In the chaos of a tornado's core, debris and air move together, but not perfectly. Structures, trees, and terrain can slow winds closer to the surface, so the actual ground-level wind may be slightly lower. Even so, the reading stands as the best direct evidence of the tornado's raw power. The Fujita scale, which rates tornadoes from F0 to F ion type, Y, was never designed for numbers like these. F5 begins at 261 miles per hour. Beyond that, the scale simply stops. Some in the meteorological community debated whether the Bridge Creek tornado should be considered an F6. Officially, the answer was no. The scale's creator, Dr. Ted Fujita, always intended F5 to be the upper limit. The record stands, Bridge Creek's tornado is rated F5, but its winds, as measured by Werman's team, remain the fastest ever documented. For scientists, this was more than a statistic. It proved that tornadoes can generate forces far beyond what building codes or engineering models had ever anticipated. For the people in the tornado's path, these numbers were not abstract. They explained why entire homes vanished, why cars landed in fields, why nothing above the ground was safe. The strongest wind ever measured was not just a figure in a research paper, it was a force that reshaped lives, neighborhoods, and the science of severe weather. Block after block in Bridge Creek looked like they had been erased. Where houses once stood, only bare slabs and scattered debris remained. In neighborhoods like Willow Lake and Southern Hills, families who huddled in underground shelters emerged to a world they barely recognized. Cars thrown hundreds of yards, trees stripped of bark, mailboxes the only clue to where a street used to run. Survivors described crawling out of storm cellars into silence, the air thick with insulation and shattered lumber, their homes reduced to nothing but splinters. One resident later said, I couldn't even tell what street I was standing on. The houses were gone. The cars were gone. It was all just debris. Yet even as the tornado's core left nothing above ground, the difference between life and death often came down to where people took shelter. In Bridge Creek, those who followed warnings and went underground survived winds that left no margin for error. The story was the same miles away at Westmore High School. As the tornado barreled toward the building, teachers moved more than 400 students and staff into reinforced interior corridors, closing fire doors and keeping everyone calm. The tornado tore into the school, shredding walls and scattering classrooms but not a single person was injured. That night, Westmore became a case study in how clear warnings and practiced emergency plans can mean survival, even when the world outside is being torn apart. The devastation above ground was total, but below ground and behind reinforced doors, hundreds of lives were saved simply because the right steps were taken in time. On the south side of Oklahoma City, Traffic clogged the approach to the Shields Boulevard overpass as the tornado drew near. Drivers, desperate for shelter, abandoned their cars and scrambled up the embankment, pressing themselves against the concrete supports beneath the bridge. For years, televised footage from the 1991 Andover tornado had convinced many that overpasses were safe havens in a storm. But on May 3, 1999, that belief would prove deadly. As the tornado's circulation swept over the overpass, the wind funneled through the narrow space beneath the bridge. Instead of providing protection, the structure acted like the nozzle of a jet engine, accelerating the wind to even greater speeds. The force ripped at clothing and skin, tearing people from their grip on the concrete. Several were blown out from under the bridge and hurled into the open, exposed to flying debris and the full violence of the tornado. At least one person died at Shields Boulevard that night, 
others suffered life-altering injuries. Emergency crews arrived to find vehicles overturned, debris scattered across the highway, and survivors dazed or missing. The scene became a stark lesson for meteorologists and emergency managers. The overpass, once seen as a last resort, had become a trap. In the aftermath, officials across the country began warning, never shelter under an overpass in a tornado. The safest place is always a sturdy building, a basement, or a low-lying ditch, never the wind tunnel of a bridge. The events at Shields Boulevard rewrote the rules for tornado safety, replacing myth with hard-earned, painful truth. When the bridge creak, more tornado finally lifted, the toll was staggering. 36 people lost their lives directly to the storm that night, with five more dying from related injuries and trauma in the days that followed. The number of injured rose to nearly 600. Over 8,000 homes and more than 1,000 apartments were left in ruins, alongside hundreds of businesses, public buildings, and churches. The financial cost reached $1 billion, an unprecedented sum for a tornado at the time, and the first to cross that threshold in U.S. history. Entire neighborhoods disappeared, and thousands of Oklahomans faced the reality of starting over with nothing but the clothes they wore to shelter. In the aftermath, rescue workers and neighbors became the first responders, digging through debris with bare hands while emergency crews coordinated relief as if responding to a war zone. The devastation forced a reckoning with how communities prepare for disasters of this scale. Federal and state programs began funding thousands of safe rooms across Oklahoma, with more than 15,000 installed in the decades after the storm. Public schools adopted stricter shelter requirements, and cities like Moore raised building standards for new homes. The tornado emergency warning, improvised that night by the National Weather Service in Norman, was quickly codified into national policy and is now reserved for only the most catastrophic threats. The Bridge Creek, more tornado, stands as the last F5 ever rated on the original Fujita scale, a benchmark for loss, but also for the changes that followed. The lessons learned on May 3, 1999, continue to shape how America faces its most violent storms. This tornado destroyed over 8,000 homes, killed 36 people directly, and forced the National Weather Service to issue the first ever tornado emergency. The devastation exposed critical flaws in public sheltering practices, including the deadly myth of overpass safety, and led to major changes in warning systems and building codes across Oklahoma. Yet, despite the unmatched precision of Doppler measurements, scientists still do not fully understand the upper limits of tornado wind speeds or the precise mechanisms that create such violent vortices. What is clear from government records and survivor accounts is that timely, direct warnings and safe sheltering saved hundreds of lives. Today, every tornado emergency and safe room installation traces back to lessons learned that night. The Bridge Creek, more tornado, stands as documented proof of nature's extremes and the difference clear communication can make.